I'm Al, <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to a special broadcast. The program is called Beyond the Rhetoric. This is a special collaboration of community media and community leaders, community people, uh, people concerned about the violence in our community, in our country, people committed to finding solutions. Uh, I'm the editor and publisher of Insight News in Minneapolis and host of the Conversations with Al McFarland broadcast, my co-host. Hi everyone, my name is Miss Britt. I am the co-host of Candy Fresh here on SPNN, as well as the co-host of Soul Tools Radio on KFAI. Um, we're so glad that you can join us for the post show of Beyond the Rhetoric. Um, for those of you who are just tuning in, we had a full hour conversation with all of our amazing panelists who are getting ready to introduce. And in that first hour, we discussed um, what does it mean to go beyond the, beyond the rhetoric? What does it mean to find solutions to what we know um, is the genocide of African-Americans at the hands of law enforcement, increased violence against police, and systemic racism that has been in existence uh, since the inception of this country. Some of the things that we discussed were um, unlearning fear, unlearning our biases, checking our biases. Uh, some of the things that we discussed were white people doing the work to educate other white people. It is not the role of your black friends, neighbors, cousins, girlfriends, or boyfriends to educate you on your white privilege or what it means to exist in America in this heightened time of racial tension. Um, we also talked about the psychology behind when there's a police officer in your school, and that's your first introduction to law enforcement, and you see them slam the fourth grader who sits next to you, how that creates a bias within you um, and a separation. So how can we increase police relationships between communities of color? How can we have police officers that police communities of color but then go home to all white suburban neighborhoods? What would it look like to restructure our country or build a new foundation in which racism isn't uh, the basis, uh, where racism is eradicated and where we can learn uh, to put our biases behind us and work collectively and cohesively together? So we're going to continue that conversation, but first I have to introduce our awesome panelists who took us beyond the rhetoric in the first place. Uh, at the far right of the table, we have Kathleen Cole, who is the Assistant Professor of Political Science at the Metropolitan State. University and is a core team member at Showing Up for Racial Justice Minnesota, which is an acronym also known as SURGE. Next to Kathleen, we have Andrea Jenkins, who has an MFA in Creative Writing from Hamlin University. Uh, Andrea is a Naked Stages Fellowship um, recipient for Emerging Performance Artists, um, has also received awards from the Givens Foundation for Black Writers, the Verve Spoken Word Grant from Intermedia Arts, uh, and was recently invited to the White House as a result of the amazing work that Andrea does. She's also the published author of several books, one of them being the one that's in front of me, The Tea Is Not Silent. Um, and uh, you'll hear more about the work that Andrea does in just a little bit. Directly to my right, we have Dr. Bravada Garrett Akinsaya, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and fellow in African American mental health and black psychology. Dr. B has over 30 years of experience as a Minnesota provider and is the president of Bracken's Consultant Consulting in Psych Services and is the ex-director of the AACI, which is the African American Child, Child Wellness Institute. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and to my far left, Andre Cohen. He's a speaker, a teacher, and a racial justice advocate next to him. Uh, Asha Long, organizer of Black Lives Matter Minneapolis and campus organizer for Impaired. She's also a visual artist. Next to me, Bill Woodson, PhD student and research fellow at University of Minnesota. He's formerly the assistant dean at the University of St. Thomas, and he is the founder of Learners to Leaders, uh, and also the creator of the Outreach Scholarship uh, uh, at the University of St. Thomas, uh, and he's also seeking to launch a community justice pipeline scholarship at the University of Minnesota. So let's uh, start off by, we've asked uh, people in the audience to either write questions, be prepared to stand and engage this panel with uh, questions and comments, but I want to have this panel take about 30 seconds each just to reflect on what's on your mind right now based on the conversation we just had. Uh, Andre, start with you. So uh, one of the things that uh, occurred to me is that uh, it's important to change the culture of policing. Um, it is uh, 
very fascinating to me that we take our best trained officers and put them on the best ships. Um, and that we take our least trained officers due to seniority and they get the so-called worst ships. And typically, the, the ships that are uh, less desirable have the highest level of challenges uh, I in terms of uh, activity. So that, that strikes me as interesting that we need to uh, rethink how we uh, reshape the culture of policing. The other thing that I, I just wanted to say very quickly is um, as Ash and I were talking, there are people who have very specific and um, interesting thoughts about Black Lives Matter. And, and I, wanna, I wanna put this out here and be very clear and very plain about this, that there are no other institutions that have been speaking out with the ferocity and the clarity that Black Lives Matter has been speaking out with. And so uh, the questions I have are, you know, where are the leagues of human rights? Where is the Department of Human Rights? And having these conversations and standing up and, and making public declarations on the, the issues that Black Lives Matter is, is raising. And so whether you like Black Mi Lives Matter or not, whether you understand whether you like their tactics or not, you have to understand why they're acting in the way that they are. And mostly it's because no one else is. That I, I take that compliment to my family, to my tribe, to my community. Um, through our conversation, I also uplifted, um, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm 25. Our, our steering committee um, ranges from 25 to 30, but, you know, where I am really inspired and what, um, where I get my fire is from our youth, our high school youth. I'm not sure if you've seen, but high schoolers have turned up in the last year in ways I have never seen before. Our babies are doing it. Our babies know. And 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 honestly, for me, I'm I'm kind of just like, how do I pave the way for you? What space do you need? Where do you need me at? What resources can I give to you? So I definitely have to uplift how amazing our black youth are. Um, and also, I was speaking with Bill Woodson, and we were talking about uh, community oversight and how important it is that we, you know, really make that the foundation of our next, you know, police policing strategy, our, our policing structure. I was speaking with my ED um, not long ago, and he actually was talking to me about a model where um, there would be a citizen review board along with the police, but also there would be a CEO of the citizens review board that actually the chief of s the chief of police would um, fall under fall under the citizen review board. What would that look like if like we were actually policing ourselves? And um, we were also talking about the need for police union contracts to be amended and how it's important that we in actually Bill brought this up that we incentivize you know cops living in the communities that they're serving like perhaps as he brought up it's you know alone perhaps it's alone in that neighborhood we have to somehow get back to community policing and if we don't know each other then how can you tell me anything and so make it brief, make it brief. I, I promise <laughs> uh, but I do have to say that Asha I have to smile because uh, I was uh, 25 32 years ago and uh, so when you talk about how amazing the youth are I'm just looking at you going yes yes you are <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, my focus I come to this work from a organizational effectiveness standpoint and uh, this is an unusual uh, organizational challenge but it's solvable and in fact it should be easy because we all have the shared same interest every time a life is lost in the, in the presence of law enforcement uh, everyone has lost the community has lost law enforcement has lost no one's winning and so we have a shared interest and the sooner we recognize that and move forward the, the, the faster we'll get this problem solved Dr. Akinsaya, I know you wanted to speak to um, the internalized racism um, when that we experience. Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I wanted to make sure that we didn't um, forget that there, there is a white racial frame that white people internalize from the time they are children up to adulthood. But there's a counter frame that people of color also hold. I once heard Cornel West say, you know, a white woman came to him and said, you know, I think I've overcome my sense of white privilege. 
And he said, well, that's interesting. I've been working my whole life, and I still haven't overcome my sense of your white privilege. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a counter frame where we've internalized that we are less than, that we don't have the right to have wellness in our lives and in our community. It, the sister talked about how we kind of have co-opted and, and given up our power to other people. And, and as a psychologist, that thing, that's the thing that pains me the most, is that we don't realize we have a right to wellness, that we are divinely created. And everything in us is, they say that civilization was in the womb of Africa from which we all came. How can we be ashamed? But we are, and we hold that shame, and we teach that shame, and we nurture that shame. And we put it from transgenerationally, and we, con we just continue it. Mm -hmm. And that sense of self-hate allows brother to kill brother, mm -hmm. and, bro and brothers to beat sisters. Mm -hmm. It allows us to hurt ourselves. So while we're talking about Black Lives Matter, let's make our own lives matter to us. So I think it's a, I'm telling you, I think it's an affirmation to us that this Black Lives Matter movement is not just telling white folks that our lives matter, it's telling us that our lives matter. In psychology, we call that cognitive reframing. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. But, uh, you know, for me, that, yeah. thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Because for me, Won't for me, it? that really <laughs> brought up um, Dr. Joy DeGruy's work, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. I read that, and I didn't understand how many nuances we had in our community that were built on a script of safety because we didn't want our baby snatched up because we just wanted to be okay. And, you know, that's why, you know, we have this summer, we have really focused on healing justice and how important it is that we love on ourselves. And, you know, and even more importantly, that we're not eating like enslaved people anymore. We don't have to eat like enslaved people. We don't have to. Yes, it's cultural. Like cultural. It, <laughs> it is cultural, yes, but we, I mean, we, we as black people, we did the best we could, and we made the, 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 the crappy parts into the best meal ever. That's comfort food to me. But we don't have to eat like that anymore. We don't have to live like that anymore. We don't have to live and feel like that anymore. So we, it's, like you're saying, we have to reframe the script that we're telling ourselves and to our children. Mm -hmm. Andrea. Yeah, this is Andrea, and and I I do I just want to honor and lift up um, Asha and and also all the Black Lives organizers all around the the country, um, and and here in the Twin Cities, I mean, the young people, and it is primarily young people um, that are that are doing this work, and it's just so inspiring and so amazing, and it gives people an opportunity to come in. Wherever they fit in, um, you know, it's 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 loose and, and disjointed. There's no real hierarchies or leadership structures, um, and and people sort of come together on their strategies um, as issues arise, and I, I love that. Um, so I just want to honor that and and I know that it's it's really difficult you know when you're outside and it's 30 degrees and snowing like and you're staying out at three o'clock in the morning like mm -hmm. what are we doing this for mm -hmm. and and it is for us to all wake up I think one of the the biggest challenges that I was thinking about since the break is male patriarchy and what has now been coined as toxic male syndrome. And, and really, when we, when we think about this, you know, and this, and Lord knows I love men. I, I have no hatred of men, but I understand that there's a problem. And our society, our culture, all throughout the world has been based on men having the power in our cultures and societies, and and yes, white men, but in yeah, all yeah, cultures, men, well. men mm -hmm. I mean, Massage black, Asian, like, you know, men, period, mm -hmm. everywhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we have to deal with and address those issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hillary Clinton is probably 
the most qualified person to run for president ever. Mm -hmm. And they say she needs to be thrown in jail. Like, that's straight sexism. It is, straight up. And, you know, it's, it's just a real issue that we have to deal with. It goes beyond these, these racial inequities that we're talking about, but it also is related directly to these racial issues that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. White men, in this case, in this country, trying to hold and dominate all the power over everyone. And that's the issue that we need to get with and address. Thank you. Kathleen? I think what I've been thinking about for the last couple of weeks um, has really come out of Black Lives Matter, both at the national level and uh, here in Minneapolis, and how do we vision a world beyond police? And how do we vision a world beyond prisons? Uh, right now, we've been using the police to do a lot of jobs that, frankly, they are not the best to do. They are the people who interact with um, people who have mental health issues. Um, they are the people who are interacting with people who are displaced from the economy, and therefore, um, as you were saying, have to sell cigarettes or sell CDs or you know do something um, outside of the traditional economy in order to make ends meet. Um, and so, you know, what? How do we how do we envision a better world, a different world? And instead of funding police, what do we fund? Where does that money go? Does it go to mental health services? Does it go to social workers, education, job training programs? What could we use if we're not buying weapons? Um, and so I'm really, I'm really trying to think about um, the the demands that I've heard both locally and nationally to disarm, demilitarize, defund, and disband. And what kind of world could that be um, if we're if we're holding that up? Thank you. We got several questions from the audience, and we're going to go ahead and jump into those. And panelists, feel free to respond. Um, as you feel moved to. The first question um, said to please talk about the role of politicians, media personalities, and et cetera, who fan the flames for their personal gain. So we know about sensationalization. Um, we know about social media. Most people are getting their news from Facebook or BuzzFeed and not CNN. Um, we know that sometimes when there's a mass shooter and he's white, He's labeled as a loner um, with mental health issues and usually is given a slap on the wrist, whereas a black man like Philando Castile, who's using his rights given to him by the Constitution to conceal and carry, is still executed for abiding by the law, and even on camera. So if we could speak to um, how the media impacts us in this moment and what does it mean to go beyond the rhetoric, how can media, I think we're, we're, we're part of the solution right here, uh, SPNN is a part of the solution for allowing this platform to exist, but uh, the media is definitely a part of the problem. So if someone wants to speak to that. You know, I can say a little bit about that. And I think this is an interesting space in that we can all play and role. I can, everyone here in this room has an opportunity here. Uh, and I do this, we all do this. We, we now curate a large part of our news consumption, if not all of it. You know, We have people in our Facebook circle I post what I think is interesting to my friends who post what they think is interesting, and it sounds a lot like what I think is interesting. And it, it's very easy to start to separate from people who don't think the way you think. And so that's the tendency. That's, that's going to be the normal human tendency. Here's the, the opportunity, and that is two things. One, you know people who don't think the way you think. Find a way to engage them and become Facebook friends with them and listen to the dialogue and try to control yourself when they say something crazy. And whenever you're conservative or liberal, you, you've got friends who think something really different, you go, what the, and you have to just, just check that a minute. And the second thing is to really try to engage in conversation that's respectful, but it speaks to facts. And don't demonize. And if you don't think that you have the capacity for demonizing the other side, trust me, you do. Because I've, I've caught myself, I've been in in lectures where I was teaching on uh, on bias and on and on uh, and on you know being being you know biased or influenced by d d identity and how you dis and how you engage with others and I've had my students check me go but but 
Special Woodson, didn't you? Do? And I went, oh man, I did. So we, it, 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 it takes a lot of self policing, but it's a, it's a muscle that you can build and you can change the conversation in spaces that you converse in. So th that's my two cents on, on that. It's okay to, so to, to, to curate, but then you also gotta consciously expand your, your world. Please just talk about the psychological interdict that is happening when we look at media. For example, I don't know a black person alive, and I don't know if this is a white experience, but when there's a crime, we hold our breath saying, please, God, don't let it be a black man. Every, every time. Do y'all know what? I, can I get amen? amen? Amen. Okay, do white people do that? Okay, so that's one thing. The you second well. thing I've is never done that. she's <laughs> never done that. So, so what happens is on the TV, on the news or wherever, a crime is committed and they'll throw the p face of a black man. If it's a white man, they usually can't find that picture. Mm. Or they and use her graduation and photo and not his mugshot. There you go. And so those are the ways the me media helps that, that image. And let's take it even further and talk about how, again, it's insidious and it's slight and it's really undercover. But any movie you see, the first, if you see a black person in it, they're gonna get killed first. I'm just saying, that's another reason that black lives don't matter. They're telling us subconsciously, oh, he's not going to be there long. He's going to die, so we don't need to invest in that character. Just watch the movie. And my white sisters and brothers, they don't look for, oh, there's a brother in the show. He's going to get killed. They, and they kill off all the black folks. And the hero is always a white woman or a white man fighting or a black man who saved a white woman because the black woman got killed. So, it is, uh, so I'm just telling you, that's how media operates. Because media is dominated by white men. And of course they're going to survive. Whoever writes the story writes the ending. Come on now. Yeah, so let, me, let, me, let, let, me, let me go from there first. You know, so as a media person, I think that's a very important observation. Uh, when I worked at the Pioneer Press, for example, uh, as a reporter, the thing you notice is that when a black person is involved in a crime, back then they'd say, John Jones, 22, black, mm -hmm. did this, did that, Lucy Jones, 25, black. But then if Billy Williams did something and Billy Williams wasn't white, it was just Billy Williams. So I said, you know what, every time a white person does something, let's say uh, John Swenson, white, Let's say John, you know, uh, O'Gara, white, and see how America would like that, because you get sick of it pretty fast. But we are expected to accept uh, and to agree with that uh, ongoing and incessant uh, definition of us as defective. I want to bring up uh, someone to the microphone here and uh, respond to a question that was raised by an audience member. So I'm going to ask uh, Chief Hestness to come to the mic and also his colleague, uh, Michael Quinn. Both of you gentlemen, come to the microphone. And here's a tough question for you, but I want to also let this be a way to introduce to you people to the work that you're doing. Uh, Michael Quinn's book is about uh, the police code of si silence. Uh, the book is entitled Walking with the Devil. The question from our audience was, as diverse as Black Life Matter rallies and discussions such as this are, I've lately started to notice that white men are much less present than, say, white women. What role does toxic white masculinity play in A, preventing white men from having sympathy for the black lives that, that have been lost to the hands, at the hands of police, and B, going public with that sympathy? So what is it, Chief uh, Hesness? That's one's a little out of my wheelhouse here, <laughs> but uh, um, boy, I, you know, I wonder if, well, I mean, I'll just have to go back to police work. And, and I'm going to do what the politicians do real quickly and just say thank you, Al, for having me here today and Mike as well. Um, by way of introduction, I retired last year after 40 years and five days of police work, 20 at the city, 12 at the, as a chief at the university. So. I'm going to stop that part, and I really appreciate being here because all the actions of the last few weeks and days, uh, people are coming out to me that I know and say, God, aren't you glad you retired? And you know, the truth is, 
I'm glad I retired. They don't have to get up every day and deal with a budget or some minor issue. I'm not glad I'm not there to talk about this because that was what I thought was important over all these years. So um, I, I don't know that I can answer that for you. I honestly don't. It's, it's the, uh, the absence of white men and the hostility they seem to be uh, expressing more towards black men. Is that? Mm -hmm. Could you reframe the question? Please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh. That puts that is in a framework more specific to you. How is it for you as a white male and a former police officer that you were able to frame your mindset in a way in which you could recognize your own privilege and work within black communities without repeating these toxic behaviors yeah. of t traditionally white men? Okay, well maybe I'll, maybe I'll bring that back to kind of where I came from, where Mike came from. We both city kids, I went to Minneapolis Central. Uh, a lot of people that came out of my neighborhood and got to be pretty important people, Mayor Cheryl Sales Belton, Gary Hines, um, Judge Pam Alexander, Archie Roxanne Givens. I mean, so there, there's always been people who, uh, Gary Cunningham, so there have always been folks that uh, uh, have distinguished themselves. So for me personally, you know, I don't, I don't, think that uh, there are limitations on black people. I've, I've worked for black people like Mayor Sales Belton. Uh, I had black supervisors at First National Bank when I was uh, in high school and college. So uh, I guess I don't see it that way. In fact, well, I mentioned when we, we uh, I got invited to help uh, with Mayor Hodge's transition team. It was a real, real short process. And she uh, uh, just wanted us to like set up her first eight, 10 days, different themes each day. One day was public safety, so that's why she invited me. And we had our first session, we went around the room and she said, I want everybody in four minutes to tell me what you would like Minneapolis to be. What's your vision for Minneapolis? And I, I think they probably expected me to say, you know, safe communities and, and of course that's what I'm about too. But you know what I said, I went back to uh, Minneapolis Central High School and I thought, you know, I grew up in that community, and we're, I won't say it was a time of no racial strife. This was 1968 to 1971. Uh, and so there's plenty of racial strife around the country, but we were kind of all working class, uh, aspiring to middle class kids, and uh, you know, we knew each other coming up uh, through all those years. So that was my vision for Minneapolis. We have communities like that, that uh, you know, have decent people. You don't have to all be wealthy people, but just, uh, uh, respect one another. So, and that's, you know, to go off on a tangent, I'll, I'll try to stop here, Al, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring, bring Mike here. Bring Mike in. Uh, Mike, uh, okay. we're classmates together, friends now 41 years, and Mike's written a book that's gotten a lot of notoriety, and he's been teaching around the country on police ethics, including no less than New Orleans, which, uh, anyway, so I will wrap it up. I will just say uh, the, the Minneapolis Police Department f for in particular has changed a lot over my 40 years. Some for the better, some, some not so much for the better in some reason. When I started, Mike and I started, it was a department of 825 officers and there were five black officers on the department. The five that came on with us doubled the number of black officers on the department. I was thinking the names, I can see them. Riley Gilchrist, Monty Manning, Leo Johnson, Kim Workoff, Ray Presto. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why you can remember them because there weren't very many of them at the time. That's good. But by the same token, uh, over all these years, what all of you have mentioned is they aren't people from the neighborhood anymore. I mean, they, you get your license and you're probably suburban or rural in background, and maybe your impressions of the African-American community is what you've been seeing on the news. So we can talk a lot more, but I'm getting out of the so way. So Michael Quinn, let me ask you what you have, have talked about in your book, Walking with the Devil. Uh, what is it that ba bad cops don't want us to know and good cops won't tell you? What is it? Well, it gets back to what Andre was talking about earlier in the whole culture of policing. There's a code of silence in policing. Good cops don't talk about bad cops. They don't, they don't rat on them. They don't tell other people what they're doing. And they do it out of a sense of preservation because if you are a snitch or a rat within the police community, uh, especially if you're, if you're in your first year on the job, you won't have a job at the end of the year. They will find a way to drive you off the job. And this has happened repeatedly. I ran the police academy for four years. And many of the officers that I saw leave the academy as good, solid people, look forward to a great career, but they saw what was going on in the street, they would not buy into it, 
We started to talk about it with supervisors. And the next thing you know, they're getting bad write-ups as being not aware of their surroundings, not sensitive enough to the, the problems that they're facing, and they're out of the job. Or they get faced with something so terrible that they, that they say, we can't do it. And I'll give you an example. This came to me just uh, about a year ago from a former Minneapolis cop. She was in her last week of field training. Now, you have, to, you have to pass your field training program in order to become a fully licensed cop. And she's in her very last week with a field training officer she knew she didn't like. But they see a man on the north side driving erratically. They go to stop him, short chase. He crashes his car almost instantly because he's so drunk he can't even drive. She gets up to the car. She's driving the squad. She gets up, gets him out of the car. And about that time, four officers descend on this guy just as she's getting one handcuff on and start beating him right into the ground. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to drag him away. She can't get him away. And finally, they stop. She gets the other handcuff on, puts him in the back seat of the squad car. She sits down in the squad car herself, and she thinks to herself, now what? What was that? And her field training officer looks at her, and, she says, and he says to her, well, what do you think happened? And she looks up, and her four officers are standing at the hood of the squad car, staring at her through the windshield. And she looks at her FTO, and she says, I knew that it was wrong. I knew that if I said the truth, I was going to lose my job. I knew that. And so what I said was, we got in a short chase. He resisted. We used the force necessary to put him in the back of the squad. And that's what happened. And he, says, and he says, that's right, that's what happened. He gives a thumbs up, and the four officers walk away. She kept her job for the time being and left the department as quickly as she could. Just have you know, the country seems to be making the case for increased police brutality, for challenging Black Lives Matter and black men, black community, for the uh, gruesome deaths of officers um, in the past two weeks. But the subtext to that challenge is one to further oppress and suppress black speech, black freedom, mm -hmm. and intimidation. So the intimidation of that officer is what I believe is the kind of intimidation that exists abroad in the entire culture and always has. How do we fight it? And we've well, got 10 seconds to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> you, fight it, you fight it by making cops accountable to each other. I just finished a four-year project with the New Orleans Police Department of all places which probably has the worst reputation in the country, but in fact started a program that I, I built on a framework of peer intervention where if you and I are working together as partners, I give you permission to stop me if I'm about to do something that's going to cost me my career or that's ethically wrong, and I expect the same from you. So we together have decided that. New Orleans has um, implemented this program from the chief all the way down to the lowest secretary. So even the secretary can go to the chief of police and say, Chief, you got to stop. We've got more questions, I think. Let's thank you so much. Give them a round of, hand, round of applause. Uh, we have more questions. If you want to come to the microphone and uh, say your name, if you wish. My name is Janice Lane Ewart. I'm very happy to follow uh, the gentleman that just got off the mic because it's uh, very relevant to my question or, and or comment. There have been several conversations throughout this hour that say beyond the rhetoric. My question is, beyond the rhetoric. What do we do? What information do you have available that could use some of the assets that we know exist in our community? For example, we come all from traditions of arts and culture and storytelling and using uh, paradigms and uh, Antanasi stories, etc., to carry messages that go across cultures universally. Are you aware of any existing traditions like that that are used in conjunction with police training prior to police officers going on the street? And if not, what's your opinion about using age-old traditions to break down the issues of racism and stereotyping through arts and culture? Thank you. Um, actually, I just wrote a book chapter with um, with some colleagues from Harvard talking about uh, creativity and black resistance. And in it, we talked about how 
part of all cultures involve pieces, like for example, uh, there's a concept, of, they call it bilateral brain stimulation, where when we beat a drum, it's like our heart beat. And when we beat drums and we use all of our full body, it transforms trauma from, from cause trauma is not just held in your head or in your heart, it's really held in your cells. So part of the trauma of racism is shared by all of us, you know? And so part of it is how do we, like in my clinic, we, all of our senses are used in the healing process. It's holistic. And so sometimes it's a mom holding a child. Sometimes it's a husband holding a wife. Sometimes it's a single woman holding herself. But the key is how do we connect trauma recovery to our bodies, not just our heads, not just to theory, but how do you do it? And, and I, when I was at University of Houston, they had a very powerful cadet program. And one of the things that we did is, it's kind of a, what do y'all call it, a semi-military, uh, something military? Paramilitary thing, I knew it was something like that. So they would have cadences, and like we used that for Project Marua, our parent boot camp, they would have cadences of affirmation that made them actually march to words that were affirming to life. And what I found in training those police officers, I only did that once bunch, so I don't know. But one of the things that I found was they were afraid of, I, that's why I came with, led with fear. They were afraid of acknowledging humanity. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of caring too much because I might lose my edge. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I get too sensitive about seeing a black boy and I think that's my brother, I may not have that judgment that I need. Because if you call me and I'm a police officer, I either protect or serve. Don't call me if you don't want somebody arrested. Wellness Center um, in uh, in South Minneapolis um, is is certainly a place to, to go to reconnect. Um, I would also s suggest that people find their spiritual roots, whatever whatever that is for them. Um, for me, I happen to be a Christian. I happen to be a uh, a, a holy Christian, as uh, as our, our label is, and we praise on Sunday until there's sweat dripping down our backs. Not just because we're fanatical about what we believe, but because that is, for us, one of the most tremendous stress relievers we can have all week. And so I, I would say that mind-body relationship is extremely important. And whatever tradition that you practice, I think it's important to practice a tradition. And so uh, I, I think spirituality in all of its, its forms is beneficial, particularly in the protection of that human soul. Um, and it, and it uh, buffers those 48 chromosomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Thank you. One of the things that I might offer is that, um, um, you know, I'm a poet. And um, you didn't you didn't mention Miss Britt that I also won a Bush Fellowship a couple of years ago, and and some of the work that we did in that fellowship was every time we would get together, which was about for for two days every quarter, mm -hmm. and we would start our session with a poem, and we would end our session with a poem. And it, it's about mindfulness. It's about mm -hmm. understanding your your mind in its connection to the body and to whatever spiritual practice that you may have. But it's a way of just getting people grounded in, in the work that they're doing. And so, man, I would love to see every police department every day before they go out on the shift start with, um, a poem by Mary Oliver or um, Maya Angelou mm -hmm. or Andrea Jenkins or <laughs> you know somebody something yes. to to bring that tension down and to bring them more in touch with their humanity. I want to come back to, to media. Uh, you know, I, I want to applaud uh, young people who've taken the digital experience to a new level. 
what's happening today what's presenting change and opportunity is the willingness and the acumen of young people to grab this technology and own it and shift it and make it do things that nobody intended it would do. And so a new skin is uh, covering the planet right now. And that skin is the connectivity that digital media affords. And I want to praise and encourage young people to keep on the forefront of reinventing new ways to communicate, to connect, to assemble. And I know that what you're creating is structures uh, new institutions that aren't like the old institutions, but ones that will serve the new humanity. Yeah, I actually was going to bring that up when you were talking about media. You know, I'd, liberal media, um, for a while there, it was increasingly hard to find. But now we're seeing a lot of our own storytelling come out. We're seeing a lot of um, our own media channels. I don't know if you know Unicorn Riot. They are everything they tell it how it is and they show it as it is no fudging of the facts but like you're saying we are seeing social media be used in a way it was never intended to be used especially when it comes to twitter and the way that blm has used social media campaigns um we have used twitter storms and with our hashtagging and you know, with our shared solidarity, because the, the beautiful thing about Twitter is that we can share our struggles internationally as black people. Black people in France were out there protesting. People in Dublin were out there protesting when Philando and Alton were murdered. And we, we wouldn't see that any other time. I mean, it, I mean it, we're in an age that this has never been seen before. And, you know, I think the best example of that is when a group of us, Knock and BLM, we, you know, cut splitting and lurking in Minneapolis. I don't know if you guys remember when that happened, but it was a Twitter storm that actually turned the power on its head and actually made them bend. You know, and a lot of these conversations that we're having is due to, you know, the way that truth is being used on Twitter. It's, it's really important that, you know, we take this as far as we can because we're hyper connected right now. Absolutely. And this could take us so far. And we want to remind you that the hashtag is beyond the rhetoric while we're speaking of social media. So <laughs> if you have something on your mind that you, if you're not able to get to the microphone or if you want to uh, let someone who's not watching know, uh, make sure you use the hashtag beyond the rhetoric. We have another question here. Please state your name and your question. Yeah, my name is, my name is Steve and I'm a friend of Al's, so. Um, and I just have a, just a couple of things I want to throw out. First of all, I just want to thank all the people who are at the table up here because you all added some right and some righteousness to the conversation. And there needs to be conversations that take place and um, two-way conversation. Just like the brother said, sometimes we can't get so self-righteous that we can't hear what somebody else has to say. And I think we get caught up in that sometime and, you know, the media and so forth and so on. So, but I just have to say that, that I do appreciate all of you uh, being here. Thank um, you. Just got a couple things. Yeah, and the I sister. Have the time for one question. I'm oh, sorry. okay. Anyway, uh, we need to take care of our own, like the sister pointed out here, the good doctor, because, you know, there's, we don't do that well enough. We c criticize everybody else. But uh, what, again, what about the two-year-old brother who, you know, just, we just laid to rest? What about the grandmother who was in her, you know, van who got shot? And, you know, we're quick to be in front of the media on a whole lot of other things. But as far as I'm concerned, we didn't take care, we haven't taken care of good enough business when we don't take care of business. And we let something like that happen and we don't speak up in, about it, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. We got to do that. We can't be blaming others for that. There's blame to go around, but we have to take care of our home. We got to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and going beyond the rhetoric, I think it's Im um, important to note that um, imported guns from other countries don't get into neighborhoods where people who don't have passports without systems in place to put those guns there. Drugs, and I'm saying this as someone who buried their own cousin just a few months ago at the hands of another black man, so we definitely need to do more about it. No one showed up at my aunt's house to march. I totally get the sentiment, but I think while we go beyond the rhetoric, we can't just say, oh, we're shooting one another. We have to acknowledge that in areas where there are fewer resources and more guns and more drugs, that these systems are set up in place for this violence to take place. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Your question? Uh, my name is Akinyele Akinsoye, and uh, 
I try as much as possible not to participate in this because my spouse is on the panel, and I try as much as possible not to make it a family affair. But then, I'm a political scientist, I'm a, an energy developer, and I really get tired when I see the media or the people in the media try to blame President Obama. First, the minute he became a president, Senator Mitch McCollin said, I'm gonna make sure he's a one-time president. Then yesterday, he was reported again while speaking at the Republican National Convention of saying that the day that Justice Stone, uh, Antonin Scalia died, he was gonna make sure that President Obama never, not wasn't going to, never appoint the next Supreme Court ju Justice. What I see happening is this. I see a Republican Senate or a Republican Congress, both the House and the Senate, bas ba they basically say, oh, here's this black guy. We're not gonna, we're gonna make sure he does not achieve whatever it is that he's trying to achieve. So the Congress holds the purse. Actually, the House of Representatives holds the purse. They do not allocate everything the president asks for about gun control, about issues that matter to the American people. They hold, they withhold funding those projects. Then they turn around and blame him. Well, he has a, a black attorney general. He has a black uh, this, this. He can't get anything done. How do we deal with such a blatant racism and obstructionism in Congress, why blaming President Obama for everything that he doesn't have anything to do? Maybe Kathleen should take that on, because to me, <laughs> Kathleen, is what you're talking about. How do we get white people to do the right thing? <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Americans, um, compared to citizens in other democracies, are, are really uninformed about how their institutions work. The idea that people could think that Barack Obama is responsible for legislative policy is um, ind indicative of the fact that they don't understand how the institutions work. Uh, I see my job as a political scientist um, as making sure that, number one, people understand how institutions function, where power is, where are the points of access, and how can they leverage that power. Um, and number two, how can we make new institutions? I think our institutions are inherently undemocratic. They, are, they were meant to be undemocratic. They were uh, meant to constrain the will of the majority to r protect um, wealthy elites. Uh, when, we, when our start country started, it was bankers and lawyers, and uh, it continues to be bankers <laughs> and lawyers who are governing us. Um, and I, I think that, um, I think that there is, I think that Clearly, racism and white supremacy is built into the opposition to Barack Obama, um, and that people who would see Barack Obama as a problem can play on the fact that Americans don't understand how these institutions work, and that we as political scientists have the obligation to make sure that people understand how these institutions work so that they're not susceptible to that kind of manipulation. Um, so we can at least separate, separate out the political sophistication and knowledge piece um, as one thing we have to deal with while we're also dealing with white supremacy and taking that on as well. Well so. said, thank you. We wanna thank the audience for all of your questions um, as well as the people at home who asked questions via Twitter. Um, the hashtag is beyond the rhetoric and we wanna thank you all for joining us and panelists, thank you for your contributions. Um, we're getting ready to wrap up the show um, I know Surge Minnesota is always um, opening their doors to if there are white allies who want to get involved, that is an option. Uh, Dr. Akinsaya, you mentioned a, web, a website. Can you give that website again for if people are looking for training? Yeah, I've just said Project Implicit, but also the Association of Black Psychologists mm -hmm. is a great resource because they have many trainers who talk about implicit bias, how, how to undo it, and using the psychological principles that I talked about because learning and unlearning, they are all on the same veins. And mm -hmm. we can teach you and we can unteach mm -hmm. whatever we learn. Uh, I want to say, Andrea Jenkins, I have the book here, The Tea Is Not Silent. Um, we spoke about the power of art and how often artists are not included in the conversations about change, but every police officer goes home with the radio on in their car. Everyone turns on a TV. Art is everywhere. Um, Andrea, can you speak to how uh, people can get in contact with you or other resources to help move them beyond the rhetoric? Well, absolutely. Uh, the Tea Is Not Silent is um, available on Amazon, 
dot com and so please uh, pick it up and and it is being taught in a lot of classrooms I think we do have to understand um, all parts of our communities and I think one way of getting to some of that understanding is through our through movies through music we mm -hmm. know that the power of music um, is um, inherently um, shapes our lives and who we are. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm absolutely proud to be an artist and I think artists and particularly artists of color and even more specifically black artists have a responsibility to speak to these issues. Absolutely. Panelists on the left, do you have a website or one reference that you can give for folks at home and in the audience to move them beyond the rhetoric? We have one minute left. Well, one of the important things, again, that we've been pushing is healing justice. As black people, it is so important that we're taking care of ourselves. And by loving ourselves, that is a very blatant uh, activist state. So one resource that I would have to push is the diaspora of black healers. Um, they do body work, mind work. They can really help you put your put you back in your body as the United States tries to scare us out of all the time. Thank you. I would also say that uh, it, it's also important to push back against the media. Um, if you believe that King Kong is really about a gorilla and that the Planet of the Apes is a movie about apes, then you have succumbed to the mysticism that is our media. And so we have to push back against negative media that continually perpetuates uh, stereotypes, fear, and hatred of not only black people, but white, white people as well. Thank you. Uh, Chief Gregory Hesnes and Mike Quinn as are, and I are all part of a larger group that's working to bring an initiative to the University of Minnesota to bring uh, scholarships and training to bring more people of color and from less privileged backgrounds into law enforcement. So as that movement comes forward, you'll have an opportunity for community input and support. And so I'd ask you for that support. And I know mm -hmm. my turn, I've already used it, but I couldn't let the, the panel go by without saying that black women's lives matter too. Mm -hmm. And that we can't forget that in this conversation and that we are traumatized and it's okay to get mental health support and to get help. Mm -hmm. You are traumatized and it's okay to get help. In fact, it's imperative. We have to heal. Thank you all so much for your time. This is Beyond the Rhetoric, the post show. I must remind you, it's an election year. One of the main things we can do to affect change is to go out and vote. My name is Miss Britt. I want to thank my co-host, Mr. Al McFarlane, as well as all of our sponsors. Uh, go to spnn.org for more info on how you can go beyond the rhetoric. And thank you for watching. <laughs>